The, I know for sure the people I'm going to be discussing are pretty much the devil. So this is why I went with this. It is a Merlot from Washington State. Um, do, 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 do. It doesn't really have any information about it. It's very, it's kind of a generic label. I'm not going to, but the title of it's cute. Okay. Um, I would give it, so Merlot, uh, I'm trying to decide. I would probably do three and a half, maybe four star or four star, not stars. We don't do um, stars here. Knives on this. It's good. It's dry. It's a little bit drier than, my Lord, little bit. Have another drink. <laughs> drier than, um, what were we drinking last week that I really liked? The, uh, we had. It was what, a Zinfandel. We, Zinfandel. That's right. Which I was is what like, I what, Yes. So a little bit drier than that. So I think I'm more like into the Zinfandales right now, but yeah, this is definitely good. Three and a half knives for sure. Okay. Nice. Mine is Sin Zin. Oh, I love it. Yeah, it is a Zinfandel uh, from Alexander Valley, which I guess is in California. The label of this is very interesting though. It is. It gives a very um, like Garden of Eden vibes. That is what exactly I'm like what picturing. I of. Yeah. So it's a neat, I, I like it. It's very artistic. It looks like a hand drawn picture. I like, I like the label. Yeah. And this is one of the ones that my mom got me for an early birthday present when she Aww. went and picked out the like weird titles and weird labels wine. But I really like it. It's a, just like I said, like a Zinfandel. It's not as dry as the one we had this weekend. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's more sweet though, but it's not as dry. Like it doesn't give that like burning dryness that some do, but it's good. I like it. I'll give it four knives. And I think I'm leaning more towards Zinfandels now, which is really weird. Maybe we like, we've grown. Maybe we've tapped out our bottle of, I agree. you know, Grigio and we need to like switch it up some. I agree. I'm definitely liking the more. Uh, middle range reds versus like super dry obviously not and then never sweet sweet and even when I'm looking at the bottles I'm like cringe um I did want to give a shout out to this wine really really quickly I'm not drinking it today but I saw it at the store and had to get it um it's it's our house is your house the original house wine this um I'm going to take a picture of it and put it on our Facebook and our social medias. So it's adorable. So it's a house wine, limited edition rose bubbles and $2 of this. Every sale of this goes to the human rights campaign. Um, I love it. And I'm probably going to end up keeping this um, can or maybe I might not drink it. Hold it up in the camera so that, cause we're, this will probably be our first good YouTube video. Um, I really like it. It's a rainbow flag. I I love Mm -hmm. it. It's beautiful. It is. It's, it's adorable. I love that they are, you know, working towards a goal here with the human rights campaign. And so I just had to pick it up and share it with you guys. Yeah. I like it. So um, I had Illinois with uh, either mutilation or torture and um, my husband always listens to our episodes afterwards, like, you know, with the regular, you know, listeners, he listens to them and, 99% 99% of the time he's, you know, either cracking up or, you know, it's, it's, but I started to tell him about this case and he's like, I can't, I can't listen to this one. And I'm like, Whoa, you better at least download the episode when it comes out. <laughs> tell him to just skip forward till mine. Yes. I will tell him because it's, it's pretty, it's pretty rough. I got my information from Hutton forensics.com courthouse news.com. Um, and a few various like local newspapers. Um, so this is 100% out of my comfort zone with this case. Um, the spin of sin led me to talk about this case. And so that's really what I'm going to do. Um, it's beyond tragic. And honestly, it's pretty difficult for me to talk about. Um, but someone may hear this and seek help for themselves or possibly someone that they know that might be living in this type of conditions. 
And that's what we're here for. We're here to advocate for those that no longer have that voice and to help those that are currently in difficult situations and just need that push. Mm -hmm. Um, so we are going, I'm going to talk about the area really quick before I jump in. So this happened in Quincy, Illinois. Um, it's located right on the Mississippi River. It's called the Gem City. It's, it's, it has a beautiful historic district. I mean, and they've got everything from hills to woods to farming land all in this little area. Um, all, overall, it's a very quaint small town almost like pitch, pitch, oh my gosh, I cannot talk today, pitch, picturesque. <laughs> um, all of the, the photos online, you're like, oh, this is just like somewhere where you would want to retire to. It's very cute, especially because it's right there on the river. So it's it's got a lot going on as far as, you know, imports and that type of stuff. Um, back in the day, it was a big hub for um what are those barges that's coming along like the Mississippi River to drop stuff off and things like that. Um, the case I'm going to tell you about is really anything but quaint. This is a sad story um, that should have never happened. And as far as the people responsible, I honestly have no words except for my wine matches you. You literally have to be like the devil, devil incarnate to do what I'm about to talk about. So Dorothy Dixon was a 29-year-old developmentally delayed mother of a one-year-old child, okay? She was also pregnant um, at the time that she met her death at the hands of one woman and her, pretty much her entire family, including her children. Like, ugh. So the woman that is responsible for Dorothy's death is named Michelle Riley. She made friends with Dorothy, all to gain access to Dorothy's monthly social security checks. So uh, Dorothy was mentally delayed. So she had, you know, she was getting social security checks every month. She did have a one-year-old. She was pregnant. Um, what's kind of worse in my mind, and this wasn't just a random chance meeting, like on a bus, I don't know, anywhere. This, Michelle worked at the West Central Illinois Center for Independent Living. So she worked there. I'm not really sure of her position, but she was employed by this place that Dorothy went to. She went to this place to get assistance on how to live by herself, how to care for her child. You know, those resources that luckily we live in America and we have resources for the people that you know, need the help. And she needed the help. So she started going to this, this independent living center. All right. This is how she met Michelle. Um, so she, Michelle knew of her disabilities and essentially she exploited those disabilities to gain financial, um, to gain money essentially. So I'm going to describe some of the horrific things that uh, this family did to her. So what happened was Michelle trying to be the good friend or, you know, hey, I work at this place. I want to help you out, Dorothy. I understand you need a place to live. You can come and be one of our roommates. This is what she told Dorothy. So Dorothy's like, jumped Wait. at the chance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. she, yes. All for her to live alone, but not really be alone. She's like, okay, great. She moves in with this family, mm -hmm. Michelle's family. Um, she lives there a few months, only a few months before she ended up dying. So mm, Dorothy is at this house. And this is some of the things that happened to Dorothy over those last few months of her life. She was, her sleeping arrangements were in an unfinished basement of this house. She only had a thin rug and then like a thin, dirty old mattress on this concrete floor. And that's where she had to sleep day in and day out. Um, when she would try to go and get food, like from the refrigerator, because you have to remember these people are taking her entire social security check. So I'm sure it kind of, you know, when Michelle was working the details out, she's like, oh, you know, we'll give you, we'll keep the check, give you some spending money, but that'll pay for your food. That'll pay for your shelter. It'll pay for, you know, all the, this and that. So Dorothy should be allowed to go, you know, eat the food, whatever that was, you know, what was prearranged 
Mm-hmm. However, when she would go try to get food, so if she would break down and be like, hey, I need to go get some food. The rest of the family members would use her as target practice for a BB gun. So she would have to go as quick as possible. And she knew that this was going to happen every time she tried to go get food. Um, so obviously she limited the amount of time that she would, wait, you know, wait, 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 wait. So she would come up the stairs from her basement dungeon. Yes. And basically run to the kitchen in hopes she can grab something and run back to the basement as quick while as while they're yes. while they're shooting while they are with shooting BB her gun. with the BB gun. Yes. Okay. It gets much worse. Much, much worse. What so, kind of yes, ass- like I don't yes. know, there's not even a word for the type of people these are. Mm-hmm. And if it gets worse, I'm it gets worse. It gets so much Whoa. worse. Yes. Okay. okay. So, um, that's, that's kind of how she would, you know, get food. They also burned her skin with so many different things. Obviously the, you know, cigarettes, sometimes they would do it with a hot glue gun. They would do scalding. They would put scalding liquid on her skin. Um, just so the skin would peel away. Um, it's just, it's sickening. Sickening. Hold on for a timeline. Does she have a baby at this time? Yes. So she has a one-year-old, a one-year-old boy. So and she had a one-year-old and was pregnant before and was she pregnant. moved in. Before she moved in. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the one-year-old was with her as well. Where was she living before this? I'm not quite sure if she was living at, you know, an assisted living place. And then she okay. was trying to, you know, eventually get out of like a group home like, or something. Where are the the she, I don't think she has children. oh yeah n- there was not one thing about that and I was like was this thing consensual what these that's ba- what these I'm babies? wondering because yeah, if there she's, was mm-hmm. if she's mentally handicapped or if she's not what what is the the PC term I'm so sorry uh, that's probably uh, not the right term everything I read mentally disabled Ment- okay if she was mentally disabled th- that's the first thing I'm going to think is that the, maybe exactly. these children were not of a consensual I agree. Okay. Yes. And I thought that as well. It, there, in all of the articles that I read and the research, there was not one hint of who the father of these children were. So I'm going to assume that they don't know. Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm going to assume that as well. Okay. Okay. Back so um, they also burned all of her clothing. So she was forced to walk, walk around naked. So now she doesn't even have like slight padding for when they're shooting her with BBs. So she had to literally like run through, through the house to get food, butt naked um, while being shot at. Okay. So then they, they burnt her all the time, burnt her skin. They beat her not only with their hands, um, honestly, any object that they could find, um, it was reported an aluminum bat they would hit her with, um, metal handles of things, a wooden plunger, like anything that they can pretty much, they would just beat her with. Mm-hmm. Um, there were cuts on her scalp that went all the way down to the bone. Um, she was- They were missing- like open? Yes. Yes. This is, this is now like, as they're doing the autopsy, this is what they're finding out. Cause they didn't, obviously no one knew all this stuff was happening. Otherwise I- So she died. So she died. Yes. She died. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, they found what else? So they had the, the cuts on her scalp. She was also missing teeth. Um, it didn't really elaborate on how those teeth became to be missing any of um, the any of the before mentioned torture exactly malnutrition exactly. beatings baby guns like any of it could have happened any yeah. anyway or they could have you know removed them on purpose I, oh, it, it don't could go, be, oh i know it could be vast like what and it was it kind of it was just like oh and she was missing teeth well what the hell happened to the teeth so anyways so she was missing teeth um Okay, so during the autopsy, they found 30 BBs lodged into her skin. Okay, so you're obviously thinking that this is total shit. Like all over her body, she has BBs that, I mean, and not all BBs penetrate the skin. Like when you're hit, I mean, I've been hit with a BB gun and it didn't go through my skin. It kind of like- but it hurts like a mofo. It hurts like a mofo, but so these had to have been close enough range to go through her freaking skin. 
like and I mean, like the whole the purpose of a BB gun is to inflict enough pain to divert like for animals. Yes. Assume, you know, like if you have, I don't know, a raccoon in your trash can, you would pop yeah. it with a BB gun to like encourage it to not come back. The moving on. But yes. you need to shoot from a distance that it doesn't permanently injure that animal or that I mean, I would never shoot a BB gun at a person, but I've been hit with a paintball gun point blank range, and that's no that's no fun either. That's so, no fun. Yeah. So these had to have been at close range, I'm assuming, to mm-hmm. actually penetrate her skin and her muscles. Mm-hmm. So they found 30. Okay. 30. The family would also dig out some of the BBs with a knife, which led to infection. Like you, I mean, you can just imagine them like digging around with a knife to get the BB out of her skin. Yeah. And she's living in less than clean conditions i'm going yes. to assume like yes. i'm going to even assume that she didn't even have a bathroom in the she basement didn't. she had a bucket she had a bucket yeah. in the basement and yeah no she's naked there's no you no. know cleaning the wounds or anything no like neosporin that. no nothing no I mean, she barely so, had food to keep her immunities it, up yeah so um oh. this is what ultimately led to her death was the infection and also dehydration um, the infections were literally all over her body. Can you imagine dying from dehydration and infection? That has to be grueling. It's, that's not an overnight situation. That is not an overnight situation. Mm-hmm. They, that is days of suffering and pain. It's not months. Yes. Yeah. A long oh. time. She only lived there a couple of months. I mean, good Lord, if she, yeah, if she endured more, it's just whatever. So this woman endured this treatment for months, like I just said, and all just to keep a roof over her and her young child's head. Um, Even with her delay, like, you know, her mental delay, she was still just trying to be a mom and protect her child and be like, okay, I need to give my child a roof over his head. So this is, you know, and these people manipulated her to think, oh yeah, this is what's supposed to happen when you freaking live with, like, it's just such bullshit. Did the child endure any of this? So um, not as far as, like torture or doing like things that but he was only 15 pounds and I mean I'm thinking he was probably like a about year old a year year and a half yeah 15 pounds yeah which is I mean my nephew is five months old and he weighs way more than 15 pounds well I mean my oldest was eight pounds at birth I mean that was like yes. he, by two months old he was 15 pounds, 15 pounds. yeah Oh so the baby, but the baby did serve. I mean, yeah, the one-year-old did survive. Um, he was, and he was obviously removed from these monsters home. Like as soon as Good. They, um, yeah, and you they know, no right. You know, anyways. you know that when she was running through that house pregnant, first of all, second, when she was running through that house, she was only going to get food for that baby. You know, she oh, was. Yeah. you know, you know, exactly. It's just, Oh, I told you, this is not going to be a good one. No. Um, the baby that Dorothy was carrying did not make it. Um, she was about five, six months pregnant at the time of the death. And first of all, being dehydrated and malnourished, even if she died, there was no way that that baby would have survived. And it's just. So how long after she died before she was found or how was she found murdered? Um, so I think they ended up like calling the the ambulance or police and being like the people that live there. Wait, I'm going to get into the people that live there. Oh, okay. I'm, yeah, and their names I'm pulling a Melissa there. and asking all the so, questions. Yeah, it's fine. Like I'll shout their names from the rooftops because they are sick human beings. And I they hope better they be in jail. Them. They they are. They are. Um, okay. So now for some justice, obviously, because mm-hmm. I couldn't, I couldn't do a case this horrible and then not let you guys know that it's at least been solved as much as it could be solved. Um, so Michelle Riley ended up pleading guilty to first degree murder. Um, she received a sentence of 45 years in prison. I don't think that's long enough, but we'll just go with it. So Benny Wilson, I'm not even sure how he's related. If he was, he's possibly Michelle's boyfriend. Maybe I'm not sure who Benny Wilson was. He's a person that was always at the house. He was sentenced to 30 years and he also had a, a first degree murder charge. Okay, this is the part. I mean, all of it pisses me off. This pisses me off even more. So, Lachelle McBride pled guilty to second degree murder. This is her daughter. This is Michelle's daughter. And Michelle, Lachelle was probably in her early 20s at this point. 
So she got only six years in prison. Okay. I'm getting to the part that's super annoying. These next people that I'm going to talk about are all Michelle's kids that played a role in the death. So that means they were beating Dorothy. They were shooting Dorothy. They were torturing Dorothy in her last days. Um, yes. So then we have a Michael Elliott, who is 21. He pled guilty to second degree murder and he was sentenced to eight years. We have Judy Wood. She's a friend of Michelle's. Um, she's 46. She pled guilty to aggravated battery and was sentenced to only 18 months. And then 12 year old boy, it didn't release his name, but it was her, Michelle's son, was found guilty of second degree murder in juvenile court and was sentenced to only 60 days of detention and five years of probation. So this mother effing Michelle, not only is an effing murderer, you know, a horrible, horrible human, human being, she gets her kids, her 12 year old to do these things as well. Like, what did she think? And they didn't even get like, I mean, like, obviously they're juveniles and they don't know any better. And like at 12 years old, their mind is still forming to create their own. Yeah. And you're going to do what your mom wants you to do essentially. But I think you're going to be well, it's that same leading by example. If you see your parents doing it, your mom, your mom's boyfriend, whoever, the whatever the role model, parental role model in that room, you're yeah. going to assume that it's correct and that it's right and that it's acceptable because if a grown up is doing it, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, oh. they're taught that there are people that are lower than them and they're perfectly okay to torture those people. So obviously, she fails as a freaking mother at the very least of everything else she has done in her lifetime but now like she's condemned her son her 12 year old who could have been anything now he's a convicted murderer i um, hope i don't know if those those will be sealed or not but think of all of i mean i feel like my kids need therapy just because i yell at them occasionally or hey i say no to nintendo switch but yeah, i'm sorry you can only play your video games an hour a day heaven forbid me be the worst mother ever and that you're going to need therapy because I've limited your screen time. Exactly. And this, that, who knows what else this kid saw? Like, I'm glad he got punished. I feel like he needed to know what he did was wrong and that there are consequences. Even when you're 12 years old, there are consequences. So I completely agree um, with him being punished. Um, I just hope he gets the help that he's going to need in this. The ones that are in their 20s, Ah, first degree murder. You guys are bye bye. You should know better in my mind. Even if your mom is killing someone, you should know, hey, I'm not going to do this and I'm going to yeah, do the right not thing. Not okay with that. Not okay with yes. that. So essentially, that's my horrible story. Okay. Um, I'm trying to see if I had anything else. Yeah. I mean, these people are exactly what's wrong with this world. We're, uh, sorry about that. Um, and they, they feel like they, you know, deserve more than other people and they have a right to not at all for what, I mean, social security checks aren't millions of dollars, people. It's someone's life is not worth that Yeah. or any amount of money, but especially social security mm-hmm. checks. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. Well, I want to move on from yours because yours was terrible and I don't even want to like dwell on it anymore. Yes. Terrible. Oh, why did we put that on the spin of sin? Next time we're not going to have that. That's a, that's a rough one. Don't like yes. it. And think I didn't even do a kid, but the fact that she was developmentally delayed and they took advantage of her just pisses me off, but yeah. okay. Go on to your happy okay. story. It's not happy by any means. I know. I know. We're just, we suck today. This guys. is just not a good, this is not an up episode. There's, there's yeah. not anything we can joke about. There's not anything like that could even be considered comical in any of these no stories today not. it's a it's a downer day but i want to talk about um i had washington state and some missing persons and luckily we, i mean luckily we just got back from there and we met some amazing people while we were there so i'm going to briefly cover two cases this is not the justice and deep dive that these two missing people deserve so we will be revisiting these cases 
Um, but I did want to go over them briefly because I just happened to get Washington and a kidnapping or missing persons. So it just seemed right to give you a little bit of a synopsis of both of, both of these cases. Ex- yeah, I agree. We met the mom of one and friends of the other one. Mm-hmm. And it's just, I'm so glad you're doing these ones. Yeah. So like I said, this is going to be very brief. It's not super detail oriented, but more will come with these. We are going to talk about the disappearance of Matthew Enfelt as well as Logan Schindelman. Now, I've got a lot of different references for these, but because it's two different cases, I'm not going to list them here. I'll put them in our show notes that you can see on our Google Drive. But I do want to mention that Washington State is in the top five states in the U.S. for missing persons. I'm not surprised by that because we knew that before we went to Washington, and I've heard lots of stories from Washington They currently have 643 total missing persons cases that are currently being worked. California, Texas, and Arizona lead the boards in missing persons, but Washington is still right up there. California has over 2,000 right now. Holy moly. Mm -hmm. Texas has over 1,000, and I was... I'm not surprised by that because the sheer size of Texas, Yes, but that's still a lot of people to be missing. And I think California, a lot of people might go missing on their own. I'm from California, so I cross the border (laughs) or just like, cause the lifestyle there is just so hard. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Yeah. So like we said, when we traveled to Washington to research the Karen Bodine case, which is coming out June 1st. So keep an eye out for that. (laughs) We had the honor of meeting some of the devoted individuals, missing loved ones. We met the mother of Matthew Anfelt, like Melissa said, and a family friend of Logan Schindelman. And so This is just a brief, brief, again, brief, brief synopsis. I'm going to start with Matthew. Matthew Daniel Anfelt was born on January 27th, 1999, and he was very close with his family, especially his mom, even after he had moved out and lived on his own. He was five. This is already making me sad. (laughs) He was five, six, five, seven, around 100 to 111 pounds. So just like a bean pole, essentially, Mm -hmm. is what he looked like. When he was last seen, he was a lover of wrestling and music. He had his own band. He had this uh, Facebook page for his, under his pseudonym, which was M.T. Hayes. And what, I don't know that when we met Matthew's mom, we also met his sister who was birthing Matthew's niece. And she is naming the baby after, as a, as a tribute to Matthew. And I think it's just so beautiful and that she's trying to keep his memory alive for her daughter. Yes. I just, yeah. Oh, okay. Go on. Yeah. So events leading up to his disappearance kind of started back the evening of December 22nd in 2018. Matthew was on his way home after hanging out with a coworker in Lacey. Lacey is where we spent the majority of our time while we were in Washington. Um, that's where we spent the most time with Carly. And so we, I feel like we have a good feel for the town. Um, yes. It's similar to the town that Melissa lives in. It's a little bit larger. There's like 300,000 people that live there, but it has that newer. It's newer. Yeah. Yeah. A lot, a lot of things are growing there. It's, it's, it's growing rapidly. I think faster than they expected it to. Yeah. Very cute town. Mm -hmm. His cell phone was dead and he didn't have a car. So he was walking home from this evening with his friend. He was walking down Sleater Kinney Road and he saw three individuals wearing hoodies that were kind of like approaching and almost following him. And as anyone would, it would make, it made Matthew uneasy. So he ducked into a nearby Rite Aid store at the corner of 7th Avenue Southeast and Sleater Kinney Road Southeast. He of course milled around inside for a little bit, like an hour or so thinking that either they got bored of waiting for him to come back out or that they had moved on or maybe they weren't even following him at all. And he was just being a little bit paranoid about it. Maybe they just kept on walking past the entrance, but after an hour in a story, you would kind of think that they had better things to do or they'd gotten bored or moved on, but especially a writing, which is kind of like a Walgreens or a CVS if you're not from like that, but you can't, there's not too much to look at. So I think he did the smart thing, went in there, like, hey, let me get some lights, like other people around. I mean, that's yeah. what I would have done. I think that was amazing of him. Yeah, that was very, um, he was very aware of his surroundings, I yeah. think. In that Proactive. Moment. Yes, that's the word I'm looking for. So unfortunately, they were still sitting out front when he came out an hour later. Matthew decided, I'm just being paranoid. Like, I'm just going to head home. This is ridiculous. He didn't confront them. He just kept on walking. Mm -hmm. He turned down a back road and tripped over his work boots that he was wearing um, when he turned down this back road. And the three people were following him and did jump him. 
they beat him they cut him up with some a, a knife or some sort of shank like object it, it didn't really state exactly what his injuries were caused by they uh slashed his body his arms and even carved the word kill into his chest what the hell mm-hmm. like this is this is more than just like a mugging this is yes. not a mugging Or like, hey, I'm mad at you. You stole my girlfriend. I'm going to have my friends beat you up. This is not. This is much, much more. It made me think a lot of like gang retaliation. Yes. Is what the feeling of reading this story made me feel. But like, he didn't have any known like gang affiliations or he was, he's just a dude walking down the street. And obviously he's in and out of consciousness because his body is going through Uh, this terrible thing he's being mm -hmm. beat i'm sure his head is getting hit on the ground you know like the trauma that's happening here he's screaming out for help and he's just in and out like in and out of consciousness he did manage to wake up and make his way home after the three assailants left and that just breaks my heart for him. Like he wakes up alone and has to walk all the way to kind of get help. Like I just, and he's still like, I mean, yeah, he's technically an adult, right? He's 18 mm-hmm. at this mm-hmm. point, but he's still like, he's still a son. He's still like her little boy. Like, mm-hmm. uh, yes. Okay. Um, at some point when he got home and he had plugged in his, his phone and he recorded a video of himself crying while covered in blood talking about how I can't, which a lot of people are surprised by this that I've read in these articles. And like on Reddit, there was a lot of comments of like, why would you record yourself in that, in that instance? Like, why wouldn't you get in the shower or go to the hospital or call the cops? Like what, why was your first instance to record yourself? But this generation records was- everything. <laughs> I was just about to say that um if you're over 28 that's not your life but if you're under 28 you record everything yeah your reaction of oh my gosh I just tripped and stubbed my toe on the couch you're gonna record it like that's just what they do I don't I don't this coffee this coffee was amazing let me show everyone how amazing it was and my reaction to taking another sip like it's what they do and I know I think it's weird too because I'm very because we're older millennials Yes. I mean, we have a podcast and we talk about a lot of shit of our lives, Mm -hmm. but on, on my like personal Facebook, I'm very, I don't like to put, I post generic things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll post pictures and my husband's always like, Oh, I'm going to post this. I'm like, no, that's too in depth with our lives. Don't post that. Because we were raised in a very different world. We were, we were raised in the generation where internet was just coming up and running Mm -hmm. and that it was a scary place because everything is out there now people are taught everything is out there on the internet if that's where it's supposed to be you you can find anything on the internet that's where you want to be you want to be internet famous do not know how to he was not supposed to call while i was recording i said text (laughs) it's fine okay so he recorded this video of himself crying covered in blood his brother older brother saw it on his social media and frantically tried to get in touch with Matthew I don't know that he ever did I didn't find like proof that he talked to his brother but the next morning his brother Matthew did take the video down after he kind of woke up and was like maybe I shouldn't put that out there yeah can you imagine how the brother felt like was it his his older brother his older brother yes Okay, so I know older brothers pick on their younger brothers like crazy, but they are the only ones allowed to do that. Yeah. No one else. They're, they are the protectors of the family. Yes. Like instinctively, they protect their younger siblings. Whether they like yeah. them or not, like you said, that's just what they do. Yeah, and the, like the feelings that his brother must have had watching that video and someone doing that to his brother. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, crazy. So the following morning, since that video was already out there and his brother already knew, he did tell his mom and asked to go, um, his mom asked him to go to the hospital, report it to the police. Like, we've got to do something. You can't just let them get away with treating you that way. It's wrong and you're Mm -hmm. hurt and you need help. But Matthew refused because he thought it may put his family in danger. That's how much he loved his family, that he would not go to the doctor after he had been brutally beaten and stabbed and cut and tortured. He would not go to the hospital because he was worried for his family. 
Sarah, his mom, asked if if he knew who did this, and he said he didn't. But then he would also like when she would bring it up again later, he would claim that he didn't. I don't owe anyone any money, so I don't know why they would do this to me, which is kind of like an offhanded comment to make. Like, well, that's interesting. Like, yeah, so does someone have a motive or not? But he wouldn't ever really say. He would tell friends later that he knew people were out to get him. I don't, but he I, never I like like, elaborated. I know, and it seems like he knew who did it they were yeah because if it was random you wouldn't be worried about your family you would just exactly. be like these mother truckers need to be put away if it was random but if it wasn't random then you'd be like hey no um like i know you know what's gonna happen if i say anything type of thing so mute your computer i don't know but i don't want to mute you you won't on okay. the touch screen Okay, up at the it. top okay all right so everything dies down a little bit to, until february 28th 2019 there's not really any more incidents obviously his mom's still trying to get information out of him he's kind of just like let's move on let's get past it you know there's not a lot going on there's no other attacks for instance yes matthew and his sister spent the day bowling and just kind of hanging out again family kid this kid's a homebody family dude wants to hang out with his family they were going to watch a movie in his sister's room, which his sister's room was off of the garage, which was kind of like detached from the house or like on the back side of the house, um, away from the main house. Okay. Ma- Matthew said he needed to grab his phone, but then never returned to her room, which was kind of strange. Around 527 PM, police were dispatched to the home, which was located on whole old highway 99 Southwest after a neighbor called to report Matthew acting erratically. He said that he was ranting about his entire family's death and claiming that unknown individuals were still after him. The neighbor would say that it appeared he was in the middle of like a mental breakdown. And it was reported that after his interaction with the neighbor, he jumped a fence and ran into the road, causing several vehicles to swerve and like slam on their brakes. Then he jumped onto a car and into a bed of a pickup and then like ran away. So he's acting kind of strange and scared, nervous. Again, mental breakdown, panic attack, kind of mm-hmm. is what I kind of feel like he was having was a panic attack. Yeah, definitely. At 5.30 p.m., Matthew was seen entering the Speedway grocery store approximately two miles from his parents' home. Now, we, when we were there doing the honking wave, we were across the street from this grocery store, which is why that location was chose because it was the last known place that Matthew was seen alive or was seen, period. He's still mm-hmm. considered a missing person. So, okay, so it was two miles from his house from his parents home okay how much time passed three minutes that's what's so confusing is he jumps into the bed of a pickup do so do they drive him like does he ride in that pickup until they realize he's behind I, i don't know that's what's kind of confusing yeah that's okay okay i wanted to make sure i knew it wasn't a lot of time but then i just wanted to double check on that okay and this is a quick search, like this may not be exact times, but it was a very small amount of time between 911 call and when he was seen in the store. Okay. And no way he could have run. Walked. He couldn't have walked yeah. that far. No. Yes. Okay. Or and even ran. On. Did the lady, did the neighbor call 911 right away or we was it? I don't know. Okay. Okay. Sorry. You know, timelines are like everything. I know. So I'm like, okay, maybe she saw it and then was like, what the crap? And then, you know, find the phone and blah, blah, blah. I'm assuming the 527 time frame is when the call came in to 911. Okay. Yes. Because it's a very distinct phone number, like a very distinct time. I don't think she'd be like, you know what? It was around 527 that I called. So I'm assuming yeah. that very distinct number is when the call came in now whether it was immediately after if it was like she watched him run off and was like that's kind of weird and then she goes inside and she's you know making herself a glass of water this. and then she's like oh yeah. shit maybe i should call that in that's kind of strange you know when I don't do know. you know when his sister last saw him like around that time it was around five o'clock so there's like a 30 minute okay okay, discrepancy. okay. Yeah. gotcha i think it was like 509 it was like a weird number okay i just didn't write it down okay that's okay. so The clerk inside the Speedway grocery store said that he appeared panicked and he was sweaty and he had dried blood around his mouth, which I think is interesting. I don't know if he got, if he hit his face or uh, who knows. He had dried blood, what appeared to be dried blood around his mouth. He kept saying his entire family had been murdered. The clerk called 911 when 
um, around 6.30 p.m. And Matthew ran out of the store when he heard her call 911. And that was the last time he ever heard, he had ever, he's ever seen alive. He's ever been okay. seen. Okay. okay, so they call 911, but he leaves right then. Yeah, and that was the last time he has ever seen. That's crazy. Numerous searches have been conducted. The family, law enforcement, they're all still seeking answers. Uh, obviously, we'll do a more comprehensive deep dive on this case and talk more of the actual investigation at a later date, probably in season three. So remember this case because we will be revisiting it. It's just, it's mind boggling. Like what just, happened? There's got to be more information out there. There's just, someone knows something for sure. On yeah, that I one. was about to say that someone knows something and they just need that person. Okay. Oh, right. So the well, next case, hold on, I'm not done. Oh, the I next, know. <laughs> The next case I want to talk about is the disappearance of Logan Drew Schindelman. And this one is even more mind boggling than Matthew's case. What? And I don't know a lot about this case. So I pulled up a few different articles on Logan. I have listened to Hide and Seek, which if you haven't listened to Hide and Seek with James Basinger, Basinger, I can always never say his name right. Um, I recommend it. It's a good 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 podcast it's well done it's very well produced and i think it's very well um researched i think he's done yeah. a good job i think it's very, it's a good deep dive yes. into the case yes. yes um so logan was born june 27th 1996 he was raised by his grandmother in tumwater washington which is another place that we regularly we visited several different times throughout the weekend mm -hmm. we were there he attended Tumwater High School where he was the star defensive back for the football team. And his grandma would state that he, he was such a good kid and he was so athletic and that he could have, you know, done so much with his life, but he was very inside his own head. Like he had a bit of an identity crisis because of his ethnicity. He was multiracial. His mom was biracial. His dad was um, of Saudi Arabian descent and he wasn't quite sure. And his mom or his grandma was white. And so like he, he struggled with like his own personal identity is who, how do I become the person I'm supposed to become? Mm -hmm. And he really struggled with that as a teenager. Oh my gosh. I think that's amazing that his dad was from Saudi Arabia. I don't know why. <laughs> like, I just, yeah. I think now he didn't have a relationship with his dad. Okay. I did read that. He, um, he, his dad shortly after he found out his mom, that Logan's mom was pregnant with him. He moved <gasps> back to Saudi Arabia and wasn't really in their life. And um, his mom, his grandmother became the primary guardian of him and his sister, his half sister, because his mom moved back to the Spokane, Seattle area ish to a bigger okay. town to go to art school. And he wanted to stay in the smaller town and it just to stay with his grandmother. Now he did attend college at Washington state university for a year. He decided to drop out. He moved back home to help his grandma and half sister. He, liked to smoke pot occasionally his grandma would say but it did make him a little bit paranoid he didn't know what he wanted to do with his life he had several odd jobs everything from working on a farm his aunt's farm to working at a laundering facility he just like didn't have a direction of where to go yes, with his which i mean is completely yes completely understandable if i could go back and be 20 again i would not know what the heck i'm gonna do look yeah. whitney and i are in our mid 30s and we're just figuring out our shit about this podcast yeah we're just now getting our shit together guys this is what we want and so mm -hmm. no oh that poor kid mm -hmm. i mean just normal i feel like normal, normal. Late early to 20s life yeah what everyone goes through like with mm -hmm. like especially without like that direction or like knowing for sure who you are and it's hard it is so hard in your early 20s to know who you are so the morning of May 19th, 2016, Logan spoke with his grandmother while they were gathering their items for their respective jobs that day. I pictured this, um, this morning as like, they're in the kitchen, they're around the breakfast table, maybe picking up their coffee cups or whatever. And they're talking about their day and they were in a deep conversation. And she said that he seemed to be like on a mission and motivated as if he had had this epiphany with what he wanted to do with his life. And that she's like, look, I got to get to work, but we will continue this conversation this evening. And, you know, like looking forward to it, we, we got to get on with the day. So yeah. when Logan didn't return that evening, she tracked his cell phone that pinged near Olympia. 
that's where Logan's mother lived. And she assumed that Logan was visiting his mom and she kind of just went to bed for the evening. I mean, he's 20, he's an adult. He can do what he wants. I'm sure sure he doesn't have a curfew and, you know, just like normal things like, oh, he must be talking about this thing we were talking about in the morning with his mom. No big deal. Move on. So the next day, Logan still had not returned. His grandmother attempted to report him missing, but the Thurston County Police Department was closed for the weekend, which I find odd. What? I didn't know police departments closed. That's when all the crime happens. Yeah. We've discussed this as well. Yeah. So I I found that strange. Um, So she couldn't get a report in until Monday the 23rd. While she was there making this report, she learned that Logan's Chrysler Sebring had been impounded back on May 20th. And like, honestly, I just realized that tomorrow is May 20th. So... Uh, today is the 19th well they just didn't notify anyone that do they i don't know how impounds work well i mean if they just left a car abandoned on the side of the road or whatever who knows like but wouldn't they take like the registration and like send them in the mail probably i mean they don't have phone numbers associated with registration that's true so it was found abandoned at mile marker 92 on the i-5 between tumwater and maytown his wallet several bags of food his cell phone all inside this car wallet had his debit card driver's license cash it's like he just disappeared out of thin air okay several bags of food like grocery store it said several bags of food okay i'm going to assume a grocery haul i'm weird about those details like it makes a difference if it was fast food or grocery food i don't know why my mind goes to where it goes so just like If it was like fast food, it would be like, oh, it's a teenager's car with trash in the back seat, which I mean, like I'm a mom and I have trash in the back seat of my car right now, but no judgment. There's no judgment there, but they said several bags of food. So I'm going to assume it's more than like road trip snacks. Yes. Okay. So after his missing persons report came out, several people came forward saying they witnessed his vehicle on I-5 the morning of May 20th. A woman said that she saw Logan with two white men standing at the back of his car that was parked near the ex, um, near exit 95 on the side of the highway. She then remembered seeing the car in the same spot on her commute home, but the hood was lifted and no one was present. So it's almost like the three people were in the car, the car broke down, they were trying to figure out what to do. And on the way back, they couldn't figure it out so that maybe they had gone to get parts or gas or oil or whatever. Yeah. Um, and she just remembers seeing it on her trip there and on her trip back. Okay. At around 2 p.m. on the same day, three people called 911 to report a car matching Logan's drifting across the lanes of I-5 again between Tumwater and Maytown near the same mile marker where they found the car. They said it veered across three lanes toward the center median, hit the concrete barrier, and stopped. No one appeared to be driving the car. What? What does that mean? Someone had to have been driving the car. It's not possible. That's what they reported. A truck driver reported pa- um, pa- passing, reported seeing a Caucasian man with brown or red hair jumping out of the vehicle's passenger side and run into the woods on the side of the interstate. That was reported. Okay. So whenever they they made the reports that it veered off, hit a concrete mm-hmm. thing, and no one was driving, did police go out to investigate? Again, okay. this is not a deep dive of this okay. case. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm, I can't wait to the deep dive because I have so many questions. This is the first time I'm really hearing about Logan's case. I mean, I knew of Logan obviously, but I just didn't know the background of his disappearance. Mm -hmm. So now I'm like, I have all the questions. Also that same day, late in the evening, a potential sighting of a naked teenager in the area was reported, but no one knew who it was. Detective Detective Frank Frawley stated it could have been Logan, could have been someone else. Well, don't really know but it was like it, it's a as a event it, that they felt was necessary to notate um they even brought out search dogs but couldn't locate any evidence hoping that maybe they'd pick up a scent of this naked teenager and it'd be logan i don't know it's just like an interesting that's weird something that happened in the same say, area was it male was it female it didn't like I see, and that, like, okay, it could be anyone. And they said it, it was potentially a naked person. Well, like, were they naked or were they not? Like, did you see butt cheeks or not, is what I'm asking. Like, that's the end of it. Like, 
I, although okay. I will say there's some TikToks out there right now that I'm like, are those, is that skin or is that leggings? What are those? Like that's a oh. weird color. Don't wear that color. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I so get the investigation is still ongoing. Many searches have been conducted, focusing on a two mile radius surrounding where Logan's car was found. Foot searches, aircraft searches, dogs. It's all been brought out. Nothing has been found. No evidence, no clothes, no nothing. nothing it's very much like the brandon lawson case where it's like here's a car and then there's nothing else um logan was last seen wearing a black windbreaker a white shirt jeans and possibly a pair of nike tennis shoes i'm gonna include links to both of these cases in our show notes their uh, respective facebook pages and other information on them until we can cover them ourselves with the proper coverage that they deserve yes um, so that way if you're compelled to act or do a little bit of digging on your own you can go there before we can get to you or get to these cases they i know they both have either gofundmes or venmos to help with you know billboards and mm -hmm. buttons i i personally am going to wear logan's i have a button of logan's from I, where, yes. when we were in washington i'm going to wear it on my lanyard at crime con i i think that that's just a good way to honor him personally i don't know if melissa is going to do the same but it is I'm I will. maybe we should have a button made for matthew we have his flyer and have his picture maybe we can make a button and have both of them there yeah let's reach out to sarah and make sure that she's comfortable with it just for personal reasons i don't see why she wouldn't be but yeah. I would, it would be nice to do that for for matthew as well just to honor the people that we we met yeah on this journey um and maybe someone at crime con knows something you never know you, you it just has know. to be the right person see right person at the right time that's all uh, we, we always say that and we know these cases can be solved yes exactly oh uh, so the, again it was a bummer of a day it it really hey, was we're like other true crime podcasts typically we like to keep it light and like give you the information about these cases but in a way where we're you're not depressed for the rest of the day because mm -hmm. these horrific things happen literally right next door today was one of those days where we we're like okay this is you know we felt like we we had to give you these cases there are you need to know about them so yes. you know share them as much as you can um mm -hmm. we'll try it hopefully it's really not even up to us so it's not our fault the spin of sin tells us what to do but i almost think like hey it's it does it in a way of cases that aren't covered as much mm -hmm. and we get to because i know for dorothy's case like that should have been nationwide news that was absolutely ridiculous what happened and those people are horrible mm -hmm. but it didn't make national news and we would never get we would never find these type of cases without the spin of sin that's right. And also, um, I want to point out that we are almost halfway through season two. Oh, thank God. I can't wait to be done with this. <laughs> <laughs> it's not I, been kind. It has it's not, not been, been kind. kind. I'm ready because I mean, we know what we're going to do for season three. So I'm like already preparing and I'm we, ready for it. I mean, I feel like we've put out there that season three is going to be big, but you don't even know how big it's going to and be. I feel like it's more us like. I know we try to be light and airy about things, but we essentially just want justice. We want those people to come forward. And so I feel like season three will allow us to do that. Yes. And just all that is coming with season three, not just the cases that we're going to be covering, but the, the things we are going to be doing. Yeah. Cause it's all about, it's all about action. So many people and so many podcasts can just talk about it. I mean, great. I mean, it's, we love to talk about it. Yes. And we have decided, I, I think a long time ago, we decided this, but have never said it out loud that we are going to be much more than a voice for these people and for much these more. So we just had to get our shit together. Yep. <laughs> so get our ready. shit is coming together. Mm -hmm. And by season three, you will know what Whitney and I will be doing to put our words into action because yes. that's what we're about. That's correct. Okay, so I get to spin the wheel for me first this time. Yes. Right? Let's see, Arizona. Have we already done Arizona? I don't think so, not this season. Didn't you do I, Arizona? I did Arizona for the summer of 
No, you did Arizona like two weeks ago, didn't you? Did I? I don't remember. No, I did New Mexico. Did I? I I did New Mexico. Okay. I have no idea. Hold on. I'm going to have to go look now. Yes, please look. I have the worst. I will edit all this out, obviously. Okay, Okay, great. Because I'm like, I have no effing idea. Yeah, you did Scientology. Oh, in Arizona? Okay. Okay, so I guess I just didn't remove it. Okay. Okay, try again. Here we go. The spin of sin state for me will be Kentucky. Okay. Okay. And the sin, the action or crime or whatever we want to call it will be, oh gosh, a suspicious death. Okay. Okay. And for you, let's see what we got. Ooh, Vermont. Okay. It's about time you get an East Coast one. I need a break. I know. I'm glad I didn't get it. All I think of um, of Vermont is syrup. (laughs) Oh, they have good syrup there. I can only imagine. I've never been to Vermont. All right. So what do I got? It better not be torture. I can't do another torture. It's a kidnapping or missing person. Okay. I could do that. Or human trafficking. You pick. Yeah. Yeah. Something where someone was taken and something happened to them. Correct. I gotcha. Okay. So I guess that's really all we have. If you're going to yes. CrimeCon, stop by our booth. Um, tell us you message listen us. to us. Yeah. yeah. Just message us directly and we'll see about getting you a code to get a discount. Because I know like anyone can do virtual right now. There's no limit. There's and no wait list. Be- before you think, oh, virtual is crap. Virtual is amazing. End of story. It is, and I had, yeah. Yeah. It is not like the typical virtual conventions that you may have seen where it's just like, lecturing and it's just a video set up in the corner and you can't see anything like it's super interactive there's other people lots of other people that are doing the virtual option even big name podcasts i think crawl space is going to be on there virtually um there's a few other big name podcasts that are going to just be there virtually because they couldn't make it work out with their schedule due to travel and whatnot but a lot of a lot of people are signing up for the virtual options that I've seen in the discussion boards and forums. So do it, do it, do it. It's worth it. I promise. Um, yes. You do get a really good feel for CrimeCon virtually. You do, and it's so much cheaper, and you don't have to go anywhere. You can wear your pajamas, drink the wine, like Whitney and I did last year. Um, we will be going. Um, we will be. We'll have a booth virtually as well, so you'll be able to talk to us and step into our booth like last year as well um let us know just message us hey we will get you a code okay that's right okay all right until then kindness only kindness always